Hey, good afternoon. It is about 3.20 p.m. on Thursday afternoon, and I just want to apologize for canceling class on Monday. I had a very bad headache and um, couldn't make it, but I did want to get you a little bit of information so you know what was in the PowerPoint. It's going to be short, sweet, to the point, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the reflection paper as well here at the end, so um, just stay with me. 15 minutes at the most here, I think, and we'll be good. So I know that the topic of this is the American Revolution, but in reality, the American Revolution can trace itself back all the way to 1756. Uh, there is an event that happened called the Seven Years' War, and it was actually a global war. It starts in North America, but the fighting is going to go around the world. And it is this Seven Years' War that's going to be the ultimate struggle between France and England. Um, England is going to win. France is going to get kicked out of North America. And the Peace of Paris in 1763 is going to end this war around the world. <clears throat> the things that make it important and the reason it can be considered the start of this whole revolutionary period is, number one, the colonists are blamed for the cause of the war. In reality, it was the colonists. Uh, Virginia claimed land that that uh, France claimed and both sides tried to, to uh, control it by force and just things went bad. Uh, the second thing though is the colonial soldiers, the American soldiers were treated differently than the British regulars. And then after the war is over, there's a, there's a proclamation called the Proclamation of 1763 where Parliament and the King say that the colonists cannot go past the Appalachian Mountains. So you have the colonists who fought in the war. England gets all the land up to and including the Mississippi River. Colonists think it's theirs and England says absolutely not. You cannot settle past the Appalachian Mountains. So the colonists are going to get angry. They're angry because of the way they're treated during the war. They're angry because of the way they're treated after the war. And it's just altogether not a good thing. Once the war is over, the British Parliament and the King, they're going to figure out, well, whose fault was this and who owes the bill? And because it started in the American colonies, Parliament and the King decide, well, the American colonists need to pay. So there are different taxes that are put into place. There's the Sugar Act, the Currency Act, the Stamp Act, all these different taxes are put into place to try and get the colonists to pay for what Parliament thinks is their bill. So the Sugar Act is meant to stop the smuggling of molasses and sugar. The Currency Act is going to say that you can only use British pounds, you can't use any colonial money. The Stamp Act is going to require you to put a to pay a tax on any paper good, whether it be like a will, a deed, playing cards, uh, anything that is a paper. At the same time that is happening, the Sons of Liberty is going to form to resist all these taxes. And there's a group of people known as the Real Whigs who are talking about how corrupt and dangerous the king has gotten. And that's exactly what the colonists want to hear at that moment. So. The colonists are already upset with the way the proclamation of 1763 went down and the colonists are already mad with the way that um, they were treated during the war and now the entire bill is being put on them and they're having to pay a bunch of taxes that they don't agree with. Everything comes to a head in 1767 when Charles Townsend is appointed the head of the exchequer. Basically Charles Townsend is the head of the treasury and Townsend just like any other accountant is going to go through the books and he realizes hey the colonists still owe money and he's going to put a tax on just about everything you can think of and the Townsend acts are going to be taxes that are paid by the colonists on goods from foreign countries and goods from Britain itself too. The Townsend acts were seen as unfair and before you know it the colony the, or I should say the colonies are complaining again. Boston in particular, they're going to have the Boston Massacre out of this. The real Whig opinions 
are going to really catch on. Suddenly everybody thinks that the king is evil and the king is cruel. And members of the different colonies are going to start meeting together and they're going to start putting together lists of demands and lists of grievances and they're going to uh, start sending letters to parliament asking for something to happen. Um, the response to this is the Tea Act in 1773, which places a tax on tea specifically, and tea was probably the most popular drink of the day. So as a result of that, the Boston Tea Party happens, and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of tea is going to be dumped into the harbor of Boston. Oh, excuse me. So while all that's going on, I mentioned that the different colonial members are going to start meeting, and in September of 1774, we're going to have the first Continental Congress. There's going to be 55 delegates from all 13 colonies. They meet together. They write a letter to the king that says, you know, we're still loyal. Uh, we will obey Parliament, but they have to be uh, parliamentary decisions that we have a say in. They send the letter off, and while they're waiting, um, the general in charge of the British Army, uh, Lord Thomas Gage, is ordered to go to the city of Concord in Massachusetts and round up some rebels and collect some, some guns. And Lexington and Concord are going to end up being the first battles in the pending Revolutionary War. Nobody knows it's going to war, but skirmishes are starting to break out and um, any chance at reconciliation is very quickly going away. So by the time we get to 1776, the second Continental Congress is going to meet in Philadelphia and they're still hoping to find a peaceful resolution. They send one last letter to the king where they agree that those will remain loyal if the king will listen to what they have to say. Uh, when the reply comes, the king uh, says that the colonists are in open rebellion, that the colonies need to be crushed, and that the leaders of the rebellion need to be hanged. So uh, the war is going to happen. There's not much choice. Um, now, as far as how the colonists get on board with the idea of revolution, roughly 40% of the people were okay with revolution. 20% uh, weren't, and then 40% were kind of like, I'm, I don't know which way to go. I'm stuck in the middle. So a man named Thomas Paine, who is one of the real Whigs, one of the people who thinks that the, the crown is corrupt and that the government's corrupt and too powerful, he's going to write something called Common Sense, which you should have read by now. And Common Sense, more than anything else, is going to change the minds of the colonists. Uh, Thomas Paine, as I hope you saw, he gives many different arguments on why revolution is good. Like militarily, Britain can't defend us. Economically, Britain is just using us. Uh, religious standpoint, the Israelites weren't supposed to have a king. He even goes on like an ancestry thing where he says, your English king's not even English. He is from Germany by way of France. So common sense is really going to change people's minds. Uh, as far as the war goes, you can see the two different strategies here. Uh, I'm going to simplify it for you because I'm trying to be quick. Britain is going to approach this like, just like any other war they would if they were fighting in Europe. Uh, big armies on the battlefield meet each other out on the battlefield and have a, an obvious military victory. The Americans, on the other hand, all they want to do is outlast. They knew that if they dragged the war on long enough, that eventually Britain would give up. So they're two very, very different strategies that are gonna play out here. Um, there's a list of battles. Uh, there are hundreds upon hundreds of battles I could go over, but let's be real, this isn't military history. Uh, just in South Carolina alone, there's over 200 battles. So I've got here a list of battles that I think are the ones that are most important. The Battle of Long Island is the first true battle of the war. It's the largest. It's a defeat for America. The Battle of Trenton, that's the first American victory. Uh, that's where Washington crosses the Delaware and surprises a group of Hessian troops who were German troops hired by Britain. And when it turns out that there's a chance America can win a battle or two, people start 
volunteering for the army and start serving in fighting in the war. The Saratoga campaign is happening very shortly after. In, in the Saratoga campaign, it's in upstate New York. The British decide to attack out of Quebec and they march towards New York City, but the American forces cut off the supply lines and the British are forced to go back to Canada. In 1778, in the winter of 1778, going into the spring of 17, I'm sorry, winter of 1777, going into the spring of 1778, you've got Valley Forge. And Valley Forge was not actually a battle. It was a winter campsite. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that the idea of having battles and fighting during winter, uh, that just didn't happen back in the 1700s because of the weather. So Valley Forge is a location in Pennsylvania where George Washington says, this is where we're going to stay. And there's a lot of death because of exposure and frostbite and starvation. But what's really important is this Prussian commander. Uh, that's Russia with a P in front of it. Uh, today, Prussia is part of Germany. But this Prussian commander, Baron von Steuben, is going to come to Valley Forge and Baron von Steuben is going to teach Washington's army how to fight. Once leaders from France see that the American army has a chance to win, that Baron von Steuben has transformed this into a professional army, and after seeing that a couple of victories have happened against the British, the French are going to get involved and say, you know what? these American colonists have a chance to win their independence. Uh, the last battle here is the Battle of Yorktown, and this is going to happen in Virginia. It's in the fall of 1781. Once again, he didn't fight year-round, so Lord Cornwallis, who was the head of a very large British force, is going to find a place on the coast of Virginia where he thinks he's safe, and he says, you know what, the British Navy is going to come and give us supplies, and the British Navy is going to come and bring us reinforcements. And so Cornwallis just goes there for the winter. What Cornwallis doesn't know is that a force of like 20,000 British, not British, but 20,000 French and American troops have surrounded him, and the French Navy is off the coast of Virginia. Uh, before you know it, Cornwallis is completely surrounded. Cornwallis realizes that he can't get out of this, and Cornwallis is going to be forced to surrender on October 7th of 1781. Now, this was not supposed to be the final battle of the war. It just so happened that the English people were tired of fighting it. And the, the Parliament said, hey, King George III, if you want to keep fighting, you need to spend your own money. And very shortly after, the war is going to come to an end. Um, how does the war end? The Treaty of Paris, 1783. And here are the 10 parts of the treaty. I'm not going to make you memorize them. Uh, what I really want you to know is just this is how the war ends. The Treaty of Paris, 1783, is what ends the American Revolution. The revolution starts in arguably 1775, and it goes all the way until 1783. All right, so that's it for this. I think if you watch this, and if you have any questions, you ask them, you'll have enough to get through the midterm exam. I do encourage you, though, to, you know, take a little time reading your textbook and, and um, you know, making sure you understand what's going on here. Uh, the other thing I want to show you real quick is the reflection paper. So let me pull this over here. And oops, the reflection paper. Remember... Here are your instructions. It says there are a total of four reflection papers to complete during the semester. Each one's worth 5%. The reflection paper should focus on one of the assigned readings found within the Blackboard Lessons folder. Please use your first paragraph to quickly summarize the article you've chosen to reflect on. For the remainder of the paper, please give your thoughts, opinions, and ideas of the article. The best reflection papers are one and a half to two pages in length, provide a clear opinion or idea, and as convincing as to why you feel as you do. Now, if you remember, each one of these lesson folders has a set of readings. And these are the same readings you've been using to do your discussion questions. 
what I want you to do is just take one of these readings, and it can be any of the readings up through and including this lecture. <coughs> Excuse me. And <coughs> I want you to just go in a little bit more in depth with them. So let's say the Confessions of Anne Foster. You're somebody who is really interested in this. Uh, just your first paragraph, just quickly summarize. Uh, this is the confession of Anne Foster. Anne Foster was accused of being a witch. Anne Foster lived in Salem, and Anne Foster eventually lost her life. But then for the rest of it, uh, tell me how you felt about reading this. Uh, did you think it was legit? Do you think it was all made up? Um, do you think the people were right? Do you think the people were wrong? Um, any of those, uh, and all of those, can be equally good opinions. Or let's say maybe lesson four. You want to talk about sinners in the hands of an angry God and how maybe it doesn't go with your personal beliefs or or maybe you just think that Jonathan Edwards was full of it to be you know proverbial about it. Um, you tell me how you feel. And um, it is an opinion piece. Make sure that you explain why the opinion is what you have and make me understand how you feel and why you feel the way you do. If there are any questions about that, of course, send me an email and I'll answer it as I can. Uh, the last thing, um, on Monday, I'm going to give you a one question quiz. And that one question quiz, I'm only gonna ask this. And I'm telling you now, so it's no surprise, if you watch this video, you will be able to get a 100 on this quiz. On Monday, I'm gonna ask you one question and that question is, who won the Super Bowl? So on Monday, I'm going to say, answer the question I asked in the video. And that question is, who won the Super Bowl? If you answer correctly who won the Super Bowl, then you will get a 100 on that quiz. So make sure if you don't watch the Super Bowl that you at least check ESPN or check the news or do something, because that is the one question you'll be asked Monday, first thing we come into class, I will say, answer the question that was in the video. And that question is, who won the Super Bowl? All right. Thanks for watching. Less than 20 minutes. We'll see you Monday. I appreciate you. And once again, I'm so sorry that I had to cancel class. I hope you'll forgive me. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.